Hi, I'm Jana Mason with the UNHCR, which is the office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees. We're also known as the UN Refugee Agency. UNHCR was established in 1950 in the wake of World War II, initially to help Europeans displaced by the war, but our mandate was eventually expanded and over the years was eventually made indefinite. The year after we were established, 1951, the UN Convention relating to the status of refugees was adopted, and I'll be talking further about that convention. UNHCR currently works in about 130 countries, and we have a staff of almost 8,000 people. We lead the international response to refugee situations around the world. Now, before I discuss refugees and refugee law, I'd like to just briefly mention a couple of related terms you may be familiar with, and to show you where refugee law fits in. As you can see by this slide, refugee law fits into the broader international human rights law framework. As you probably know, human rights law lays down obligations of governments to protect the inherent rights and freedoms of individuals or groups. You're probably also somewhat familiar with international humanitarian law, IHL, which is the law of armed conflict. IHL seeks to limit the effects of armed conflict and to protect civilians. International refugee law deals with the rights of a particular group of people who are outside their home country and who need protection. We'll discuss this more in a minute. So refugee law is related to, but distinct from, human rights law and IHL. So back to refugees. The 1951 Refugee Convention is the foundation of international refugee law. It lays out the obligations that governments owe to persons who are or who could be refugees. Of course, before we can understand those obligations, we have to know who they apply to. In other words, who is a refugee? The convention defines a refugee very specifically as someone who, because of a well-founded fear of being persecuted for reasons of race, religion, nationality, membership in a particular social group or political opinion, is outside the country of his or her nationality and is unable or unwilling to avail himself of the protection of that country. So let's unpack this a bit. First of all, the person has to be outside the country of his or her citizenship. And second, he or she has to have a well-founded fear of persecution if returned to that country. And the persecution has to be based on one of five specific grounds. Race, religion, nationality, which is usually interpreted to mean ethnicity, political opinion, we generally understand that one, or membership in a particular social group. Now this category is sometimes considered a, a catch-all category that can mean a number of different things. As you can see from this definition, refugee status isn't for persons who are solely fleeing war or generalized violence, although that's of course a factor in many refugee producing situations. Instead, they have to have a fear of persecution. They don't have to actually have fled persecution. The definition is forward-looking. It relates to what the person fears will happen if he or she is returned home. Many refugees, of course, have already experienced persecution, or they've seen family or friends or others like them persecuted. But a reasonable fear is all that's required. Now, a term that's not specifically in the Refugee Convention, but that's relevant here, is asylum seeker. An asylum seeker is someone who says that he or she is a refugee, but whose claim has not yet been definitively evaluated. This term is often used for individuals who apply directly to a government for asylum, like in the United States, or it could apply to a larger group of people when it's not clear why they fled their country. But during mass movements of refugees, when refugees spill across a border, usually as a result of conflict or generalized violence, there's never a capacity con to conduct individual asylum interviews for everyone who crossed the border. And it's usually not necessary because it's usually very clear why they fled. We know what's going on in that country. So in these cases, the people who fled are often declared prima facie refugees. So once we know who a refugee is, what does the convention require states to do? The main obligation that governments have under the Refugee Convention is to refrain from sending any refugee back to the country where he or she could be persecuted. This obligation is known as the principle of non refoulement This is a French term that means no forced return. non refoulement is the bedrock principle of international refugee protection, and it's so important that it's generally considered to be customary international law, 
which means it's binding on states even if they haven't become a party to the Refugee Convention. The prohibition against forced return also applies to asylum seekers who haven't yet been determined not to be refugees. In other words, unless a government or UNHCR has interviewed an asylum seeker and determined that he or she doesn't meet the refugee definition, then that person needs to be treated as a refugee and can't be sent home. Now, other than not being sent back to their home country as long as they fear persecution, what else can refugees expect? Over the years, UNHCR has evolved into an agency that's concerned not only with the legal protection of refugees, but also with making sure that refugees are adequately assisted while they're outside their home countries. Refugees have tremendous needs for food, shelter, clean water, health care, and many other forms of assistance. UNHCR provides this assistance both directly and through partnerships with a large number of non-governmental organizations, as well as governments and other UN agencies. We also promote and facilitate what's become known as the three durable solutions for refugees, which are, number one, voluntary repatriation, which means voluntarily going home when it's safe to do so. Two, local integration, which means staying in and integrating into the host country with the same rights provided to citizens of that country. And finally, permanent resettlement in another country, such as the United States. Resettlement is a wonderful solution, and it helps about 100,000 refugees a year start a new life in a new country. But unfortunately, it's available to less than 1% of the world's refugees in any given year. So those are the three durable solutions. But the reality, unfortunately, is that most refugees spend years or even decades in host countries, either in refugee camps or in urban areas, while they're waiting for a solution to become available. Now let's talk very briefly about people who are uprooted from their homes and have the same fears that refugees have, but for one reason or another haven't crossed an international border. These are what we call internally displaced persons, or IDPs. IDPs are still inside the borders of their home country, but are very much like refugees in other ways, and they likewise need protection and assistance. Because IDPs are still in their home country, that country is responsible for ensuring their rights and their protection under human rights obligations. However, governments aren't always able or willing to ensure this protection, so the international community, including UNHCR, often steps in and helps meet the needs of internally displaced persons. You'll notice that I didn't mention anything about people fleeing natural disasters or climate change. This is indeed a huge phenomenon, but these persons aren't considered refugees under international law, first because they generally remain in their home countries, and second because refugee status is based on a fear of persecution. While people uprooted by natural disaster can be considered internally displaced persons, UNHCR's work with IDPs is primarily with those who are displaced because of conflict or persecution. So that's a very basic overview of refugees and related terminology. Thank you very much for your interest.